Hey, welcome to the Her Advantage podcast. Here, you are going to be part of the conversation with myself and other inspiring professionals, helping you grow into a more sustainable way of living in your body and your mind. So grab your walking shoes or a glass of OJ and let's get this party started. Welcome back to the Her Advantage podcast. I have with me Nerida. Do we call you Nerida or Nez? You can call me whatever you like. <laughs> Nerida is one of the people that I have been fangirling over on social media for many, many years. I have watched her do a phenomenal transformation, shall we say? Yeah. Um, and so when I messaged her to reach out for the podcast, I was like, yo, Nez, want to record a podcast with me? As if she's the woman that I see at the coffee shop every weekend. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you feel that safe with me. It's so nice to be here, Mel. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Nez, tell us a bit about your weekend. Uh, my weekend was pretty full this weekend, actually. I went to, I spoke at a networking event and I, um, that afternoon, caught up with a couple of friends. Sunday, I love to have, if I have a busy weekend, I do what's called Silent Sunday, where I keep the whole day just to myself. I don't talk to anyone, don't catch up with anyone. It's full of like, I go for a beautiful walk. I do a meditation. I do some journaling. I sit at a cafe and just is really just going to my own zone. Um, I go to the gym and I do a bit of food prep and get ready for the week. But it's a day that I sort of really try to keep for myself and a day that I love to like refuel and 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 sort of re-energize for the week ahead. Refuel. I love that you've like, we've already pinpointed that word because it doesn't necessarily mean food, right? No, definitely. More for me, it's more about filling my cup. Yeah. So for me, I come from dec decades of like, really, you know, working in a stressful environment, overwhelmed, lots of adrenaline, lots of like, just go, go, go. And now I'm actually really leaning into like slowing down, nurturing myself, spending more time in nature, more time sitting still and breathing and just really, really slowing time down and connecting with my feminine energy. Which ironically is making life go faster, right? Yes. Well, I don't know if that's my age. I'm 41 and I feel like the older I get, the more time flies. But yeah, essentially it's it's so important for women because women are being. We're, 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 our essence is being, not so much doing. Actually, science proves that men can handle four times more the amount of stress that a woman can handle. So one of the things that I really see a lot in the work that I do is that women are really overwhelmed with their stress, with their load, with their uh, even their mental load. And um, part of that conditioning is part of our work is to really try to unhook from that conditioning and that sort of like um, productive perfectionist, that, um, you know, that archetype where our self-worth is wrapped up in what we do and what we produce and, and what we achieve. A definition of productive almost. Yes, yes. Um, ironically, that's the subject that we're doing in Her Advantage this month is stress and looking at right. like, distress versus you stress and really understanding we definitely need stress to create growth and challenge. Yes. But if we lean too much into distress, which is where I think the um, the dominant amount of women in our society sit, yes. um, it's not going to create results that we want. Yeah, totally. I love that. And um, yeah, there's a, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think if anything, most women need less stress in their lives. Like we need to actively try to, you know, really take away um, a lot of the, the things that we don't need to do or we need to delegate. One of the things that I work with a lot of my clients around is their emotional home, their emotional addiction. And oftentimes what a lot of women do is like, we all have pain, right? We all have pain. And some of us go about suppressing our pain in ways that society deems to be um, negative, like, and un yeah. yeah, it's like addiction. So it might be alcohol, it might be drugs, it might be sex, it might be, you know, like there are ways that we avoid our pain. But one of the ways that we avoid our pain that society sort of celebrates and put on a pedestal is staying busy, overachieving, and being productive. And that's the biggest thing I see a lot of women struggling with. They are literally addicted to staying busy because they are unable to sit with themselves and actually be 
in stillness because of what comes up inside of them. And it there's layers to that as well. So yeah. when you know when we start first start to talking about this sitting still, I think again people instantly go to I relax. I sit there and mm. I can watch Netflix on a Sunday night or yeah. But that's not what you're talking about, is it? No, it's, it's about what comes up in you when there's actually nothing distracting you. Who are you when it's just you? Like, how do you... Fucking take- uncomfortable is who I am. Yes, most women are. Most women are. And so, you know, I would argue that a woman who is uncomfortable with herself, like her core self, can never actually truly step into a career or a purpose that feels really fully aligned, that she really feels joyful in. And she also can't create a relationship with her partner that feels deeply connected, deeply beautiful and and really full of love and being cherished and adored because she actually doesn't view herself in that same way. You can't be a connected parent either. Parenting really requires so much presence and and children really take on our emotions. So if we aren't demonstrating around them what it feels like, like what it's like to be joyful, to be happy, to be present, to be content, they will not know how to develop those emotions within themselves either. That, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that put that way. And yeah. you know, again, I think in the personal development space or the health space, we often talk about, you know, the mum needs to fill her cup. The mum needs to look after herself because you can't pour from an empty cup and you can't serve. But when you speak about that from a term, from terms of, you know, every mum can tell you they want their child to be happy, but what does that look like? And if yeah. again, we can't define that for ourselves, exactly yeah. that, how do we teach them? Yeah, we be it. They yeah. children learn from not what we tell them to do, but what we are. Um, and this is the piece around the emotional homework that I do. So, you know, I really believe that we all have an emotional home, and that's our the the majority of the emotion, like the three to five emotions that we felt the most from zero ages zero to seven. Now, I would argue that anyone that has a child wants their child to grow up to be um, secure have high self-worth to know that they're loved and to know that they're worthy in the world, right? So, but how do we do that? How do we actually build that in them? Well, there are no two people that each each child wants to love and be loved more than their parents. We are wired to be loved and <clears throat> accepted and connected to our two parents. But the the problem is a lot of parents are either too stressed too busy, too preoccupied to actually give that. Now, I get a lot of pushback from a lot of mothers around this because a lot of women say, well, you know, but we live in a society that requires two parents to work. We, How do we go about being present when I've got this list of to-do things? You know, I don't, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I'm here just to tell you what the result of that is. And what I think that a lot of people aren't doing is they're not asking themselves, these questions. I had a client just a couple of months ago. We were working through a lot of this stuff and and I can really see she's really in her masculine. She's very stressed. She's exhausted. She's resentful of her partner. She's got two small children. And in this session, she's, you know, going on and on and on. She's complaining to me. She says to me, it's the government's fault. It's the government's fault that, you know, the cost of living is so high. We need to both work. And I said to her, hmm, interesting. How much was that house that you bought in Merriweather? How much was that renovation that you just did on that home? You know, millions of dollars dedicated to their home, yet did at any point they have a conversation and say, hey, our kids are only really with us before they go into the school system between zero and five. <clears throat> Maybe for those five years, we buy a house that's, you know, less uh, expensive, further out of town so that we can afford for me to work and for you to stay at home and be connected to the kids. Um, And then, you know, as we move, you know, as we, you know, they get closer to school age, then we'll look at potentially buying and renovating our dream home and and outlaying those millions of dollars. Like whatever you decide, make sure you decide it with intention. Make sure you understand the impact of your decisions on your children's health and well-being because you are literally building their emotional home from zero to seven. And they need your presence, they need your love, they need your comfort, your warmth, your calm. When they are, you know, going into their sort of emotional home, they need your calm and and your sort of presence, 
not to pull away and deny, reject, suppress, or shame them when they experience emotion, which so many of us were raised in homes where that was the case. You've just touched on so many points and I can't, I can't figure out where to start, but I want to go back to that point that you said around, you know, you get a lot of kickback from women when you talk like this and agree with you in that, you know, we're not telling people how to live their life. But if you're thinking that if you've got that struggle coming up, it's pointing to another direction. And if we're here shining the light on that different direction, it's again, it's not us that's, we're not, you know, supporting you in that challenge if we don't shine the light. Well, it's more about, you know, you can react to this and 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 this might in in sort of incite a little bit of anger, a little bit of, um, you know, uh, like fear from women and, and that's okay. The question you need to ask yourself is if I'm so bothered by this, if I'm so bothered by what this person's saying, what is happening in me? Why am I getting so triggered by this? Because deep down, the only reason anyone can trigger you into any emotion is because you might, you deep down have a fear that might be true. So, you know, one of the things that I really aim to do is to help women. Women are the emotional beings of every one of their families, right? Women do this spiritual and emotional work. And then that has a ripple effect upon everyone that they come into contact with. I've seen it so many times. So for me, it's about helping women to connect more to their wisdom, their intuition, their knowing and their emotions to have a better influence on their family, whether it be their partner, whether it be their children, whether it be the, their own self, so that we are like moving through life in a way that's connected, loving, whole, supportive, and, and you know, with all of the things that we want our lives to be filled with. I see so many women today really feeling so confused, so lost and so disconnected And it's because they have not healed their trauma. They have not looked at their childhood home. They haven't done the emotional intelligence piece. They haven't learned how to communicate. They haven't learned how to be with their pain. I think the other, and, you know, when we talk about this and we talk about, you know, capital T trauma, small T trauma or pain, and I really loved how you used the word pain when you first started talking about it, didn't open with the word trauma. Yeah. I know, like, my mum had quite a traumatic upbringing you know she was a child born out of wedlock in the 60s and put up for adoption and blah 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 and I know that the work that I've done on myself I've watched her the shifts in her and you know our whole life we were like mom you need to go to therapy essentially you need to sort (laughs) this out but the minute I started working on my stuff I saw shifts in her and I was like holy Mm, shit this is literally powerful stuff it's so the same with the women that we work with through coaching They take this huge risk in being really selfish and working for themselves. And all of a sudden they're going, oh, my kids' grades are going up. My kids are coming home happier. All of this stuff is happening around them because they've done the work in themselves. Yes. Um, But if we can go like right back to the beginning, like who are you to talk about stress, right? Like who are you Mm. to talk about coming out of this, you know, living life, slowing down? Where did you start? So um, that's a great question and I love that. And and it sort of touches on a few interesting sort of, like I feel like that's an interesting question for women. Like women are always asking themselves, like who am I to speak on this topic? Well, I would argue if one person benefits from what you have to say, then you have a right to speak of it, right? So I only learned that I am someone who is a a voice of authority on this because people listen to me, people resonate with me. Every time I speak, I get dozens, if not hundreds of DMs. So while I'm getting that feedback, I'm going to continue to. But my background is I started um, a women's only gym based here in Newcastle, Australia, 10, 10 years ago now, maybe 11 years ago, and it blew up. It was kind of like a CrossFit gym, but not quite a CrossFit gym. And my journey to that was sort of rooted in my own pain. I had come home from living over in the UK for years, about 20 kilos overweight, really unhappy, really disconnected and depressed. And um, I'd seen a CrossFit gym across the road from where I I had bought a house. And this was long before CrossFit was known by people, right? It was just like, what is this? (laughs) And I, ironically, most women do sort of, have a lot of fear walking into a gym for the first time. But ironically, I didn't. I just saw this gym and I thought, wow, this looks amazing. This is something I need to be a part of. This is how 
I'm going to lose this weight and find myself again. And I walked across the road and I was met with, um, you know, someone who was really not open to letting the average person come into his gym. And, you know, once we got chatting and I told him I wanted to join the gym that I was really excited, he looked me up and down and he said, darling, this is not for you. And so that was like a really humiliating moment for me, but it was also Did a Did you invite him to the La Somme opening? Please <laughs> tell me you invited him to the La Somme opening. Oh, I know everyone always asks me that. Like <laughs> at the end of the day, you know what? I, like I, he, get, he gave me the biggest gift that day because if it wasn't for that pain, and, and luckily six months later, I stepped into a CrossFit gym that was the complete opposite. And it was full of community, full of like people that wanted to welcome anyone in. The owner was so kind and and just beautiful. And it was from that place that, you know, I began my transformation. You know, I lost 20 kilos in 12 weeks. I found my confidence. I was spending time with different people. All of a sudden I went from like, my friends were mostly people that would go out on the weekends, drink alcohol, take drugs, um, to all of a sudden I was hanging out with people who were, going for breakfast and talking about books and podcasts and going to seminars and running businesses. And so my life transformed in that community because I then started to realize there was so much more to this life that was possible. So, you know, it was such a gift because if I hadn't had that first experience, I don't think I would have been so anal and and like um, psycho about making sure people feel welcomed when they came through the door. You know, when I opened La Somme, we had this rule, it was called the five second rule. And it meant that anyone that walked through the front door needed to be greeted within five seconds by somebody. And, you know, that's why like we built such a great brand because we had these policies, these procedures, these values that underpinned the business that made sure that we were living by our values. We weren't just talking about them. We actually had ways to live by them. And so I ran that business for nearly 10 years. Throughout the pandemic, I was faced with, so in 2020, weirdly, you know, I had two sites at the time. I was on the, in the process of opening a third and weirdly, literally four years ago, pretty much to the week, I went through a breakup with my partner who, you know, I lived with, he was in the business. We talked about getting married and having kids. And then a month later, the gym was closing down. I was living in an Airbnb. I was single not able to spend time with anybody. Like it was just the most surreal time of my life. I went from thinking I was going to take this business nationally. I was going to get married to this man and have children. And my life was going this way to all of a sudden my accountant saying to me, I think you're going to go bankrupt. Um, I think you're going to lose your business. And I was living, you know, in an Airbnb, like on my own, it was just the biggest sort of divine storm. And at the time I, even though I was in a lot of pain, I also did know something needed to be born. Like I knew that it was happening for a reason. I just couldn't see it at the time. And it was did funny, you have right? that innate trust? Like in the midst of all of the pain and the breakup and the gym, like you had this like little yes. nugget inside you going, this yes. is for you? Yeah. Because I'd been there before, you know, yeah. I had been there before and I'd listened to Tony Robbins talk about this. Like I'd listened to so many thought leaders and entrepreneurs talk about this time, like this hitting rock bottom and how it's the best thing to ever happen to you. And so that was a gift. I remember thinking, okay, this is really, really hard. And I also know something's coming. And it, it really was such a gift because for so long, like I had had pain, you know, I was diagnosed with depression at the age of 22. I'd seen a number of psychologists, counselors, life coaches, psychotherapists, like I would go to people constantly trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And it was just constantly met with, you've just got depression, you've got depression, you've got depression. And, you know, I always knew that there was something deeper I need to look at, but I wasn't quite ready. And this was the sort of catalyst for me to look at myself, you know, and I'd had relationships that had fallen apart before. And I'd, I had really been in a pattern of pointing the finger and making it about them. I was one of those girls that was always like, it's their, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. They were this, they were that. They weren't emotionally available. They weren't ready. They weren't, you know, grown up enough, whatever it was, right? And for the first time in my life, I finally turned that in on myself and I was asking myself, okay, what? I'm the common denominator here. Like what's going on with me? Like why is this not happening for me? 
And I remember my partner at the time saying to me, Nez, I feel like I'm just not good enough for you. And I thought what he was saying was he felt like I was too good for him. And I remember being so confused thinking, well, if I'm this amazing woman, why do you not want to be with me? Right. And then, you know, there's like, it was such a weird time because I really didn't want to lose him. And, but yet I also couldn't look at myself really because there was so much shame and there was so much fear. And it wasn't until that relationship fully ended. And six months later, I was at a barbecue with a friend and I asked this friend of mine, I said, what is it? Like I was chatting to him and his wife and we're talking about they've been married for a few years and very happy. And I asked him, I said, what is it about her that made you want, like choose her, like marry her? And he said, Nez, she's the first woman that I ever met that I knew was too good for me, but never made me feel like it. And in that moment, it was like, oh, a massive epiphany. All these moments of me criticizing my ex, complaining, controlling, judging, blaming, directing, all these moments came flooding back and I realized what he actually meant. And it was very painful because I realized it was actually me that caused the breakup. It was actually me that, not completely, but it was a lot of my behavior that had driven him to feel so disconnected from me. Because what had happened was I had my emotional home was sadness, rejection, shame, loneliness, confusion. And for a, a year or two, I had this partner, that emotional home got pushed aside for a little bit. And it was just, I was sort of distracted and I was happy. And this man sort of made me feel better until all of a sudden he didn't. Until all of a sudden, you know, there, like, you know, there's that great quote, everywhere you go, there you are. And, and it wasn't until, you know, the, the honeymoon phase sort of ended that all my old patterns, my old ways of being, my old self came to the surface and was ultimately the thing that broke our relationship up. And that was when I really, I remember Googling one night, I was in so much pain. I was looking at all these couples, these happy couples thinking to myself, why isn't this happening for me? And I remember Googling, what is it that men look for in a wife? And the unanimous answer was emotional connection. And at that time, oh, I remember thinking to myself, what does that even mean? Yeah. And therefore started my curiosity. That was the beginning of me diving into this emotional intelligence work, becoming so fascinated by it. And I remember constantly thinking to myself, how, like I, I so deeply wanted to build an emotional connection with a man. And that started with building the emotional connection with myself. And, and that was a full 12 months of doing that work until all of a sudden I met a man who a couple of months after dating, I remember him saying these exact words to me. He said, Nez, I just feel so emotionally connected to you. And it was just the most beautiful feeling to have created that with another human being and to know that I was capable of having, being able to create that in my life. It's like, I just got goosebumps at multiple points of that story. It's almost like, to be honest, I expected him to turn around and be like, you're the first woman that has never, like, that's too good for me, but never made me feel that way. Um, <laughs> yes. That will come one day too, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, but again, you know, you set out on a mission for yourself, obviously with the intention of meeting someone and bringing this person into your life, but you had to put yourself first. And so, well, and, yeah, sorry. Well, whatever, it's interesting, right? Because everything starts with the self. Like if you want others to love you, you need to love yourself. If you want others to respect you, you need to respect yourself. If you want others to trust you, you need to trust yourself. Too Can often, I, like what yeah. does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to like someone who's never heard this work? Because I think mm. like women aren't going out there going, oh, I'm actively not loving myself or I'm not actively not respecting myself. Like I love myself. I've got a great skincare routine and I, you know, all the things. What does it mean to understand to love oneself? I think the act of loving yourself is, you know, you know what I always say to people? Your relationship with other, like think about who's the person that's closest to you, Mel? Mm -hmm. is, it a, is it a partner? Is it a friend? A friend. 
think about the way you speak to that friend, the way that you encourage that friend, the way that you support them, the way that you are their biggest cheerleader, right? And the way that you speak to them when they're down, when they're in the dumps, when things aren't going right, how do you speak to them? You probably speak with full of encouragement, love. Um, you probably shine a light on all the good good in their life and who they are. Now, do you speak to yourself the same way? I'm learning to. Right. <laughs> good. Because that's the only reason women's people's relationship with themselves suck and their relationships with others thrive is because you can't turn that same beautiful, kind, compassionate voice in on yourself. And that is the biggest piece to it, right? It's it's how we treat ourselves when we're feeling scared, angry, shame, sad, lost, lonely, confused. It's how we're treating ourselves when we feel scared. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. is the, I think that under, like if we look at women's stress, if we can understand that one question. Yeah. That would change the trajectory immensely. Because yeah. what I see is we either go into one of two behaviors, right? We either go into sabotaging behaviors and, and ultimately this all comes down to a belief system, right? So let me ask you a question. On this morning, have you left the house today at all? Yes. As you were out and about doing your morning, how many red cars did you see on the road? <laughs> yeah, you Couldn't remember. tell you. Couldn't tell now, you. If I, if I said to you last night, Mel, when you're out on your day tomorrow, before we catch up, I want you to count as many red cars as you can see because I'm going to give you $100 for every red car you see. Mm-hmm. How many red cars do you think you'd see? As many as I can. Exactly, because you're wanting to support that belief. You're wanting that that's something that your radar is attuned to. So you're going to find it everywhere you go. You're going to find evidence to support yourself whenever you want to, right? Now, the same goes for when we when we're activated in our emotional home, we do one of two things, right? We either look for evidence to support it and we go down that rabbit hole of shame and of reinforcing that shame, that fear, that anger, that resentment, whatever it is. Or we actively try to take care of ourselves and nurture and love ourselves in that moment. And and I would argue a lot of people aren't great at doing that. So, you know, it, you will always find evidence to support the beliefs that, that reinforce who you think you are. I'll give you a good example, right? I noticed myself going down a bit of a shame spiral just a couple of weeks ago. So my emotional home, one of my emotional homes is rejection. So rejection for me can be quite painful. Now, I know why, because rejection was a painful emotion that I experienced a lot with my father growing up. I constantly felt rejected by him. I, I didn't feel loved by him, cared for. So when I see some, when when I'm with a man as an adult or even with a friend, and if I experience rejection a, a, about who I am as a person, that's deeply painful for me, okay? Because it reminds me of that old pain. Now. A couple of weeks ago, something had happened to trigger that that wound, that rejection wound, and I noticed myself going onto social media and going down a rabbit hole of like looking and and wanting to reinforce that rejection. I was looking at couples' photos and families and happy families and going down this thought process of like reinforcing look at all these people out there in the world that deserve love and deserve connection and deserve, you know, family and all those things that I don't have. Oh, that's right. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not good enough for that. And I was, I was actively reinforcing this, this emotion within myself for days on end. Right. And, and funnily enough, we will do this, even if we don't want to like, it's because it's familiar. So even though I didn't want to feel that way, it was familiar for me to feel that way. So my natural inclination was to keep finding evidence to support that belief. So it's like the red car thing, right? It's familiar. It's not helpful, but it's familiar. Now, after a few days, I realized it wasn't serving me and I was I was really going down a rabbit hole. Like I was in tears. I was feeling a lot of feelings and I got to a place where I was like, okay, I reached out to my coach and she was really great at supporting me. She was like, you have a choice every day what you are going to choose and your results in your life will reflect the, the the emotions that you keep choosing to feel. And I was like, yeah, I know this, but sometimes even I need someone to just remind me of it. And I was like, okay, I need to take myself off social media for a couple of days. 
I need to look for evidence to support how much I am loved, how much I am cherished and adored and valued in society. So I was, you know, I made a point of like going over all these beautiful photos of me and my family and my, you know, the men I've been with and, you know, my niece and nephew who I adore. I made a point of going and looking at all these beautiful messages from clients to tell me how much I've changed their lives. So in any moment, you can choose what belief are you reinforcing? What emotional addiction are you choosing? What are you actively looking to create in your life? Because you can either go down that old being, that old pathway, or you can forge a new pathway. And guess what? When you go to forge that new pathway, be ready because your ego is going to start screaming. It's going to start shouting. It's going to start telling you all the reasons why you shouldn't, but that's because it's unfamiliar. On that, can I ask, you know, you you are talking about your emotional house and these familiar patterns and, you know, something they talk about is the idea that these familiar patterns are familiar patterns because they're safe. And even though they're so fucking painful, they're safe and they're familiar, which is why we keep choosing them over and over again. How do we, or can you talk on looking at the emotional house when it is so fucking painful, but comfortable? Yes. Oh my God. People would rather live with, like live with emotions that are familiar they, they, most people are comfortable being addicted to something, even if it doesn't feel good. So most people, I would argue, have you ever noticed this, Mel, when you ask someone how they actually want to feel, most people tell you how they don't want to feel. Mm-hmm. So with my work, right, I will ask someone, like say, for instance, I'm working with a woman who is a mother and she has kids and her husband, she's feeling really disconnected from her partner She's feeling a lot of resentment, a lot of exhaustion, depletion, unsupported. Um, If I ask her, how do you want to feel? The first thing she'll say is, well, I just, I I don't want to feel exhausted. I don't want to feel drained. I don't want to feel. And it's like, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, what do you want to feel? Most people are so disconnected from how they want to feel. And they, they don't even know it. They don't. And even for them to speak, well, I'd like to feel energized. I'd like to feel joyful. I'd like to feel calm. I'd like to feel present. I'd like to feel happy. And most people don't even know how to create that. Most people don't know what they want to feel. They don't know how to create what they want to be. And even when they do feel it, that it scares them so much, they find themselves reverting back because it feels unfamiliar. So I used to be that way, right? I lived for decades in my old emotional home until the last maybe two to three years where I've done so much work on myself to overcome that. And I would say that I genuinely feel most days content, peaceful, loving, warm, empathetic, compassionate, joyful. And and I still do have my days where I am triggered into my emotional home, but they're fewer between and they're less intense and I know how to get myself out of them. And so that shows me progress. But I would argue that most people don't like how they feel, but they don't even know what it is they want to feel. And they're not taking responsibility for creating that. Say, for instance, I say to someone, okay, all right, well, let's take your husband. We're going to turn him into the most supportive person. We're going to, all these things that you think he should be doing, all of a sudden, magically, he's doing them. All of a sudden, he's showing up, he's cooking dinner a couple of times a week. He's doing the dishes. He's checking in on how you feel. Now what? Are you really going to feel better? Or is it only going to be a matter of time before you find some other reason to go back to those emotions again? Some other reason to feel stressed, to feel overwhelmed, to feel exhausted, depleted, and unhappy. It's like um, I did a exercise with my business coach the other day and we were talking about um, lead generation or something. And um, she was like, if you had so many clients you know, want to work with you right now, what would you say? Yeah. I'd be like, no. <laughs> yeah. And so it's the same thing, right? If we have all of this emotional support show up, like, oh, fuck, what do I do with that then? Like you yeah. have to be ready. For yeah. This- well, most, you know, I say this to women, I coach a lot of single women, right? I coach a lot of women who are very successful, very driven, very ambitious, very intelligent, And they all say that they want a good man, a man that adores them, a man that loves them, 
a man that, you know, treats them well. And yet that man comes along and does that and it, they they freak out and they find some reason to, to prove that that man just isn't perfect. It might be he's too short. He doesn't make enough money. He's too nice. Do you know how many times I've heard that? He's actually too nice. You know, I, like, and that they get the ick, right? They get the ick when a good man actually comes along and wants to love them. And that's actually because they don't know how to be loved because they don't even really like themselves. So what happens is because you are unaware of that, you don't look at that man and think to yourself, oh, I don't even know how to be loved by this person because he's treating me in such a beautiful way that it feels it feels off to me because I don't feel worthy of that treatment. No, you don't, you're not conscious of that. What you do is you project that outward onto them, that unworthiness, and you point, you find some reason in them to make them not worthy of you because you don't own it within yourself. So you will work so hard to find something about them that you can't accept in order to keep that person away because deep down you have a fear. Can we, like, that's obviously in sense of relationships, but does that happen in other emotions and other areas of life as well? Totally, totally. I see this happen in friendships. A lot of women, I don't think, one thing I'm going to start talking a lot more about is about female friendships. I see a lot of women really struggle to create the friendships that they really desire. They want deeper, more connected female friendships, but they are trapped in cycles of gossip, of complaining about their husbands, um, you know, connecting on a very surface level and they don't know how to create that deeper connection. And I think that really comes down to, again, not feeling worthy of being able to create what it is you want in your life and not having the skills to. And, you know, I think that comes from a lot of conditioning in childhood, right? A lot of women, you know, I, I would talk a lot about this in my coaching because you see men so easily go out into the world and achieve and and make money and achieve success because men are driven to do that right men know when they're born my role is to you know become a provider to become a protector to go out and and build wealth and to build success and to find my purpose in the world i would argue women usually go about that only because they fall into something that they love and they want to help people so it's not really that they are going out there I know with Lassom, I fell into Lassom just because I saw something that needed to exist and it just so happened I had to be the one to create it. I wanted women to feel included and accepted and a part of a community. It wasn't because I wanted to make money, right? It wasn't because I wanted to be successful. Now, after a few years, I did start to imagine what might be possible, yes. But, and and I see what a lot of women do because so many women connect with through gossip and surface level conversation when a woman starts to show up and want to take up space, the biggest thing that holds her back is fear of judgment and criticism. And it's always from other women. It's never from men. And so, and that's because we know the way that we connect, right? We know that, we, you know, deep down we fear that. So one of the things I love to help women do is to step into their power, to own their self-worth, to own their confidence, their self-esteem, so that they can start to have a bigger impact in the world and, and to let go of those fears and that judgment and that shame and that, you know, fear of criticism. Are we in a generation that's really redefining motherhood? Like if you, like you were just talking about La Somme and creating this thing and where we see women that are really leading, it is from passion and maybe they're not choosing to create another human life, but really, yeah, redefining what it means to be a mother. Um, do you mean, sorry, right just clarify, do you mean women opting not to have kids and to build businesses instead? No. And I don't, I, maybe it's not a, uh, maybe it's not a conscious effort, a conscious decision not to have children, but if we're women who, what, 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 where this, um, thought was coming from is that, you know, men are leaders and they know that they go out and they want to, you know, they have an instinctual let's provide whatever that is for them and then for women like you just said when you created the Somme it really came from a passion or a love and to help other people yeah and so when we see women who we define or perceive to be successful 
is that from from that point of creation, which is the yes, female, yes, that nurturing sort female. Of yeah, totally, totally. It's it's very rare that I will meet a woman like a female entrepreneur who speaks about success or, or about striving to like um to make an impact on the world or to you know the way that they go about their business in the same way a man does. Like I I have just personally noticed. I work with a lot of men and I've worked with a lot of women. I've just noticed men tend to talk more about, like take this for example, right? This is the number one perfect example. Whenever, oftentimes when a woman shares her income claims, what's the first thing that other women do? Judge her, criticize her, start to look at her, like especially if she's wealthy, right? If she's making big money. A lot of women don't like that behavior because they think it's it's unacceptable for whatever reason, right? They They use whatever they want to to claim it like they might say it's inauthentic or they might say it's being a show off or whatever it is but I'm a I'm a believer of a rising tide lifts all boat lifts all boats right like for me getting into a mentorship where the norm is women making 40 fifty thousand dollars a month made it made it possible for me I started to sort of go wow if she can do it I can do it too whereas for men it's so natural it's so normal they talk about money like it's no big deal like there is no resistance there. There's no um, sort of inner competition. Oh, there might be. There probably is competition, but I think men are naturally better at just l- like talking about money and and success in a way that doesn't bring up this inner sort of like combative sort of um, I suppose nature. Whereas I see it in women more. So I do. I, I, I think that most women tend to step into those spaces because it comes from that nurturing energy. It comes from them wanting to help. And then if it ends up meaning that they become successful, then that's a byproduct of that. But I don't think a lot of women go into business for that reason. Why are women so afraid of money or, and it might not even be finance finances in terms of let's talk about menopause. Menopause is a really big hit word in the health space at the moment. And we've sort of got two camps, this really, woe is me, like menopause sucks. I need to, I need all the support that I can get. And also this women, these women being like, oh, there's actually things that we can do to support our bodies and um, not experience what we're experiencing. Yeah. So why are women so um, open or receptive to that, to competition or wanting to create this space where we don't grow? Um, well, I think you're, what you're touching on is just two types of consciousness. Yep. Yeah. With the way I look at, there are two types of people in the world, those who take responsibility and those who point yep. the finger. I think it's really hard to look at yourself and really take radical responsibility. A lot of the reason, a lot of the reason why a lot of women struggle with wealth is because more money means more responsibility. The bigger your team is, the more people you have to pay the more people that rely on you for their job, like the more money that you make, the more you've got to manage. And and it's not to say women don't like responsibility. It's not that at all. But I think in general, people, the, the two camps that you've got are those people that are a victim and those people who are taking ownership and taking control. And I think that I see that play out in both men and women. It's a level of consciousness. And, you know, I don't even work, like if a woman comes into my space, and I hear a lot of that victim mentality, I will just very gently let her know this is not the right mentorship for, for her because in my world, I only work with women and I'm, I'm, I only really associate with women who are taking responsibility for every single part of our lives, every single bit of it. The minute, the, and don't get me wrong, I do fall into victim mindset sometimes. We I do. do. Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's human nature, but I have surrounded myself with people who, can gently call me forward. And that's, I think, one of the biggest things I'm, you know, one of the biggest things I see with women is they're so afraid to do that. Women will, you know, I remember once going through a bit of a conflict with a friend a couple of months ago. It might have been nearly a year ago now. And it came out of the blue. Like it really came out of nowhere. And after the phone call, I was so triggered. And I really wanted to call someone to just talk it through and process it. And I vividly remember two different people popping up into into my awareness, two people I could call. And one of them 
I knew would like reinforce and and like reinforce how I was feeling and my victim like you know sort of validate how I was feeling and why she was wrong and I was right and and just really sort of support my view okay which is beautiful it's supportive and it and sometimes it's validating or I could sorry I don't know if I'm doing that hand <laughs> I thing. love these things <laughs> Um, or I can call someone who is going to gently with love, you know, call me forward to see this and, and to find a way to help me to, to, to rather than further separate this person I was in conflict with, to bring me closer to more understanding, to more forgiveness, to more accountability for my side and to help me really see it from the bigger picture. And so we have that like opportunity every single day. We can every single day when we're unhappy with something, we can invite those people in that are going to call us like into a point of accountability and empowerment or people that can reinforce why we're right and they're wrong and why this person is letting us down or this person, whatever it is, right? And I would argue that's like you jumping on the bandwagon with your girlfriend and reinforcing why her husband's not a good guy. I don't think that's friendship. I'm sorry. I don't think that's friendship. And my friends hate it because, you know, and I will ask them, like, because obviously I'm a coach. When I ha- catch up with a friend and she's experiencing, you know, like discontent in her relationship, I will ask her, I'll say, what do you need me to be right now? Do you need me to be a friend or do you need me to be a coach? And, you know, I will always gently push them to see what they're not seeing. And so, I think what you're speaking to there is is just that. Yep. Cool. And a lot of people aren't going like, to like hearing that and that's okay. You know, some people aren't ready for it. I wasn't like, you know, I was not like, it's so funny. I think I lived in a fog for so long until five years ago, four years ago when this pandemic happened. And that was the first time, like 37 years old, really, really looked at myself and started taking ownership. But for and and sometimes in relationship, it can be really difficult because one person might be at that place and the other one's not quite there yet. And what I say to people is, it's like speaking a different language. Like you don't know what you don't know. And when I was before I sort of had my wake up moment, I just did not see it. You just you I just could not see it. So yeah, it's one of those things until you're really ready to look at yourself in every single aspect, like you will always be a victim of your circumstance. And it's also not our job to paint that picture for someone else. Yeah. It's It's conversations and they're not being reciprocated. Yeah. You can always tell when someone's ready or when someone's not. Like I think sometimes in coaching you can pull that out of people, but I like to sort of. They're paying you to show up, right? Oh, of course. Oh, my God. It's totally, exactly. If you're coaching someone. They're obviously paying you because they value your perception, your your advice. But yeah, if it's someone that's, you know, a friend or a family member, like sometimes the the most kind, loving thing we can do is is love them where they're at and accept them where they're at. Yeah. Um, the I know the hardest pill for me to swallow is often when I'm seeing a growth opportunity in someone else and I'm like, come on, like. Let's go. I'm like, yes. oh, why am I getting triggered around this? Like, yes. what's coming up in me? Damn it. It's the best question you can ask yourself. What's coming up in me? Why is this bothering me so much? What's, you know, what's happening for me right now? Yep. You know, we too often project that pain outward and, and focus on the other person. We go into our head, actually going into our heart and coming back to ourselves is the biggest gift we can give ourselves. Yeah. So who... Who were some of the, you know, most instrumental people in getting you to where you are? Not not in terms of um, physically, but like um, educationally. Where yes. did your yeah. journey start? Or yeah, yeah. Um, the holistic psychologist, Dr. Nicole Lapera, was life changing for me. Um, I started studying her work. Um, back when she was like really early in her career, so twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Um, I was following her and she had 10,000 followers, you know, and, and she, her book, how to do the work changed my life. I read it three Fantastic. times. I think I read it in 24 hours. Like I could not put it down. I think she is a gift to humanity in the way that she, you know, explains this work in such a 
an easy to digest way. Um, so I think she's amazing. I think that um, there are so many, like Brene Brown, I love her work. Brene Brown's work around shame changed mm -hmm. my life as well, helping me to understand my own shame and that actually this is quite common and there's a reason why I feel such a high level of shame because my father projected so much shame onto me as a kid. So it makes so much sense that I feel that way. Have um, you read um, Atlas of the Heart? I haven't yet. I've got it, but I haven't quite finished it. Just, I think even that in I, being able to identify the emotions yes. and she also talks about the opposite emotion. So like yes. maybe necessarily happy and sad aren't opposites, you know, yes. but even yes. putting a language yeah. around that. Totally. Tony Robbins work around the emotional home is what I've built my framework on as well. And his work around teaching us that we all have an emotional home really helped me to see, oh yeah, like my, I do have an emotional home that I'm addicted to. And going to see him at UPW like changed my life as well. So everything I've done is self-taught. It's all my own curiosity, my own study, my own leaning into different teachers, books, podcasts, audio books, mm -hmm. and, and developing a practice and a routine that really works for me. Yeah. Which I think is, I think people really underestimate that power as well. When we talk about like both you and I are coaches, obviously we also both see the value in having coaches. Yeah. But if you can't afford a coach or you can't oh. see value in a coach, there is yeah. literally so much free information out there so much. for you to be able to go on this journey and still feel supported and part of a community without putting a financial investment in until you are certain. Yeah, there is. There's so much out there that's free. Like, And the holistic psychologist, she runs a self-healer circle that's, I think, $15 to $20 a month. And the value that she brings in that is crazy like there is no reason even if you have no money there are so many audiobooks that are free there are podcasts like there youtube if you've got an iphone you've got access to healing there is literally no excuse anymore we've never had so much access to amazing content yeah um i think something else that i love about the holistic psychologist is the fact that i've listened to a deep dive into her podcast yes and them then talking about their relationship and the dynamics yes. of their relationship. Uh, yeah. For those of you who don't know, they're in a thruple, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we talk about navigating, we talk about communication and that just put a whole new spin on it. Yeah. And allowing yourself to drop societal beliefs and really be open to what it is that you're feeling and experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. She, the work that she does, and, and I think that's why she's so popular. She's so relatable. She shares so much of her own journey, you know, and I think that really goes against the traditional norms of psychology because you're not allowed in psychology, you're not actually really meant to bring um, your own experience into the room. And I think that's where so many people are left feeling so alone in that space. And there's often a diagnosis and no real acknowledgement of your childhood, your upbringing and, and the, the ways that you've kept yourself safe in childhood that were adaptive then that are maladaptive now. Human beings are wired to stay safe every single day. So whatever kept you safe in childhood is going to be what you have continued to play out. Some people, for some people that was stay small and invisible. For some people that was people pleasing, perfectionism, achieving, create, you know, developing a sense of humor, making people laugh. For some people it was get aggressive and be defensive. I think the best thing we could do is understand that and go back and work through that because and I, and I think that's why I love her work so much. She shares so much of her own, um, you know, sort of mechanisms that she's developed that she's had to unhook from. And, yeah, she's so relatable in so many ways. And, yeah, she's just, oh, I think she deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. Like, she's just, just incredible. Maybe that's for you and I to do, Inez. Maybe we need to create some, yes. like, actual yes. award that represents yeah. people who are actually changing humanity from... Yeah. The core. She really is. She, yeah, I've got so much admiration and respect for that woman for sure. Have you read her latest book? I've, I'm halfway through it. How to be the love you seek. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. It's sitting yeah, it's in really my, good. It's really, really list. good. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, thank you so much for this conversation today. It You're has so been welcome. So insightful, and like I, as always, sent Nez this list of topics, and I think we covered like two of them because yes. I knew that. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to say? 
No, just thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate anyone that, um, you know, is open to listening to me talk about my work. If you're interested in checking out the way that I help women, come on over and follow me at Nerida Bint on Instagram. I offer two different programs, one to support women in business, one in their relationships. And um, I just love this work. So thanks for having me on. And she is the most approachable person. So give her a follow, send her a message and say hi. We always love to hear your takeaways. So if you've heard something and had a really big light bulb moment, share it with one of us. Um, yeah. But until next time, we'll see you soon. Yay. Bye. Ooh, that's it for another episode. If you had any ooh, moments while you were listening to that episode, I would love to hear them. Pop me a message on Instagram at Melanie K underscore and let me know what they are. And don't forget to subscribe so that you and I can spend a little bit more time together in the next episode. Until then.